Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today, I am delighted to talk to Professor John J. Collins. You are most welcome, sir. Thank you. Um, John is the Holmes Professor of Old Testament Criticism and Interpretation at Yale Divinity School. He is noted for his research in the Hebrew Bible and the Dead Sea Scrolls and their relation to Christian origins. John is married to Professor Adela Yarbrough Collins, Professor of New Testament at Yale Divinity School, with whom he has co-authored the excellent book, this is it here, King and Messiah as Son of God, Divine, Human and Angelic Messianic Figures in Biblical and Related Literature. Um, this is a heavyweight book, and I really recommend it if you're interested in the academic side of this discussion. Uh, also, um, he is editor of the newly published work, the Jerome Biblical Commentary <laughs> for the 21st Century. This is a weighty tome. Um, third fully revised edition, which has an introduction by Pope Francis, no less. Um, and uh, I'm sure it will be a central reading for the student of the Bible. And I, as an undergraduate, had an earlier edition of the work, which was um, very good indeed. Now, today, John has very kindly agreed to talk to us about the Jewish scriptures and early Christianity. So if I may perhaps begin by asking the following question, and it concerns the famous and often quoted passage in the book of Isaiah, usually known um, as Isaiah 53. Is it correct to say that the famous servant song of Isaiah, to be precise, Isaiah 52, 11 to 53, 12, appears to have played no role in pre-Christian Judaism as, as a text foretelling the coming of a messiah and if so would it be christians who seem to be the first ones to identify this as a proof text after the crucifixion of jesus yes and um, by coincidence i was doing this text in class yesterday oh my goodness okay. and teaching a course on the messiah although i am now officially retired oh. i'm doing a kind of encore course on this. So um, now it's a very interesting text. Mm. Um, and, you know, if you grow up Christian, it's hard not to think of it as messianic, because you know, this is how the Messiah came to be understood eventually in Christianity. And what was different about it in its time is that what, what would it mean to be saved? Mm. So what do you need to be saved from. Mm. Now, I'd say the typical answer to that in the ancient world, not just in Judaism, is you need to be saved from foreign occupation, hunger, uh, plagues, you know, various kinds of misfortune. And therefore, in many places, the world has not changed too much in this uh -huh. regard. In many places, people think you need a strong central figure, mm. a ruler. You know, the Enuma Elish, the myth of, the myth of Marduk uh, in Babylon is typical in this regard. If you want to be safe from chaos, rally round your strong central leader. Mm. And as I don't have to belabor the point that this theme is very much with us to the present day. Indeed. Now, in the, uh, what you get in the servant song of Isaiah, which I think was quite novel at the time, is that what you really need to be saved from is sin. Mm. And the whole world needs to be saved from sin. Now, again, th this idea, all right, was around. You will get it in, in the cult, typically, in Leviticus or whatever. But, you know, applied to the whole political situation. You know, the problem confronting the prophet here is the, the Babylonian exile, you know, when Israel was almost wiped off the map, mm. indeed, one, many people would have assumed that it had been wiped off the map. And then it has what he saw as a miraculous comeback when Cyrus the Persian took over. Now, but the explanation then is, uh, the question then is, uh, if God wanted to restore Jerusalem and glorify it, why did he put it through this whole misery of the Babylonian exile. Yeah. And the idea in Second Isaiah is that the suffering itself 
was redemptive. And as I understand the passage, I'm giving you a highly simplified version of it here. Um, the, the idea was that the turnaround would be so spectacular mm. that the fate of Judah had been so terrible, it had been so given up for dead, uh, that nobody expected a comeback. Right. And then when it is restored, this would astonish all the nations, right. and they would think it, their God must be the real God. We should all go worship him. Mm -hmm. But that, of course, didn't quite happen. But that, I would say, was what that poem meant in its original time. Right. Now, when you read it, uh, and there are still many scholars who think that it's actually talking about an individual, mm -hmm. perhaps the king who died in exile, or perhaps the prophet, uh, I don't subscribe to that because in order to subscribe to it, you have to posit a lot of history for which we have no other evidence. Mm. Uh, and I think it's simpler to just apply it to the Jewish people. But at the same time, you know, it was language that could easily be applied to an individual. Mm. And so many texts in the Hebrew Bible were applied to future individuals and treated as messianic prophecies. And this one, as far as I can see, was not. Now, you will get allusions to some of the servant poems in Isaiah. Um, now, it's a very interesting text in the book of Enoch, the similitudes of Enoch, yes. where there's a figure called that son of man. Yes. And that son of man is said to be a light to the Gentiles or a light to the nations. And that's a motif picked up from those uh, poems in Isaiah. Mm -hmm. But he is not said to save people by his suffering. Right. You know, right. The motif of redemptive suffering is not picked up there. Right. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have a figure called the Teacher of Righteousness. Yes. Many of us think he wrote some of the Thanksgiving hymns. In any case, whoever wrote the Thanksgiving hymns had what you might call a servant complex. <laughs> he saw himself as the servant who was being abused by everybody, for mm -hmm. whom nobody had any respect, but God would rescue him and glorify him. Mm. But it's never suggested that his suffering would save anybody else. Right. So In the book, yeah, at the end of the book of Daniel, you have the people who are called the wise. In Hebrew, it's maskilim. And the term is picked up from the fourth servant song, which mm -hmm. says, uh, you know, yaski lavdi. Uh, behold, my servant will prosper. And that, that's the verb. And it's the, then these are the, the wise. And they apparently are put to death, but then they're raised up and lifted up to the stars. Mm -hmm. But it's never suggested that by doing that, they were saving anybody else. No. Yeah. So, as I understand it, the, the first uh, interpretation of that poem in terms of a savior figure was in the case of Jesus. Yeah. And in a way, you might say that interpretation was almost forced upon the followers of Jesus because uh, I think they had already decided that he was the Messiah. Mm. And the Messiah was not supposed to be crucified. Well, but this is the thing, John, isn't it? Because there seems to be no firm evidence to suggest expectations of a suffering Messiah in pre-Christian Judaism. Would you agree? That is, that is absolutely right. Yeah. The, the typical expectation of a Messiah is uh, somebody who would smash heads, mm. but he'd be a violent figure who would drive out the Romans, you know, a hundred years after Jesus, a man named Bar Kokhba came along who led a revolt against Rome. Yeah. One of the stories about Bar Kokhba is that he kicked a rabbi to death. Gosh. You know, he got into an argument with him. Wow. So he had a temper. <laughs> but now, if you want to lead a rebellion against the Romans, you know, that's the kind of person you want. Mm. Uh, and I think that is what most people would have thought. That's what a Messiah is supposed to do. There's a pretty standard job description for the Messiah. 
that you get now in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We have several brief passages and uh, uh, not a whole lot of other texts actually outside of the Dead Sea Scrolls, but we have some, but they're quite consistent mm, mm. You know, that, that uh, what he should do is destroy the wicked. Mm, mm. Now, in the book of Isaiah, it says he will kill the wicked with the breath of his lips. That's fine. You know, he does, maybe doesn't need a sword, but he kills them. Yeah, yeah. That's what the expectation was. And then you see what happened in the case of Jesus really didn't fit that at all. Mm. And that's why they go back to the scriptures and look, say, is there anything here that does fit? Mm. And then Isaiah 53 seemed to be a godsend. In that regard, that and then the combination of that with Daniel chapter seven. Yeah, we'll, we'll come to that. But um, just yeah. the, the next question would be: um, In Judaism before Christianity, was it the case that not only was there no strong obsession with the messianic expectations, but in a few places where there is a mention of a future Messiah or an eschatological figure? We encounter a diversity of views, different understandings. So we've got texts, you've already mentioned some of them, mentioning a Davidic Messiah, a priestly Messiah, a prophet Messiah, and even a few mentioning a divine, perhaps angelic Messiah figure. Then there's also, which you made already, a mention of a heavenly Messiah in one Enoch, um, whose activity seems to be confined to the heavens. So can you shed some light on the diversity of pre-Christian Jewish expectations of a future Messiah or an eschatological figure. And you've covered this some ground already on this, but there is this diversity of viewpoint, I think, isn't there? <clears throat> well, I'd say, you know, if you spoke simply of the Messiah, anybody in first, and this would be the Mashiach, the anointed one, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. most people would take that to refer to the king. Right. And the expectation in that case was that somebody would restore the Davidic monarchy. Yes. Now, this was on the books, so to speak. Mm. You know, there's the promise to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7 that somebody from your line will always sit on the throne. Mm. And after the Babylonian exile, they didn't have any descendant of David and they didn't have a king. And so every now and then somebody sticks in a passage in one of the prophetic books saying, but the days are surely coming when God will raise up for David a righteous branch. Mm -hmm. And then 10 chapters later in Jeremiah, you read, in those days and at that time, God will raise up for David a righteous branch. In other words, uh, don't sit around waiting for it. Mm -hmm. You know, I think many people would have thought of this the way many Christians now think about the second coming, mm. that it's something you affirm in principle, but you don't really expect it to happen in your lifetime. Mm -hmm. And I think that the mess that kind of messianic expectation generally faded into the background. Right. And you get very little of it, if any, between about 500 I think there was a little flurry when they came back to Jerusalem with the figure of Zerubbabel that they thought he would do it. And really what they were looking for was somebody who would restore the monarchy. Yes. Not somebody who would bring history to an end and went for a thousand years, but somebody who would restore the monarchy and beget a son who would continue it and so forth. Mm -hmm. But I think that they pretty well gave up on that. Mm -hmm. And the dominant figure in Judaism in the Second Temple period was the high priest. Mm. And so when you get to the Dead Sea Scrolls, they talk about two messiahs, yes. a messiah of Aaron and a messiah of Israel. Yeah. And uh, in some cases, the messiah of Aaron takes precedence. And that, I think, was what they were expecting. Now, when does any of this messianic expectation pick up again? I would say um, it, the two things contributed to it. First of all, after the Maccabean revolt, the descendants of the Maccabees set themselves up as kings. Yeah. Now, some people didn't like that at all. 
and especially when things went bad. And they did go bad, and you had a civil war between two of the brothers, and then Pompey, the Roman general, came in. And uh, around that time, somebody wrote a text called the Psalms of Solomon. Mm. And one of them is praying to God to raise up for us, a, you know, a real king from David. So it's having a monarchy that is not Davidic is what makes some people anxious to get a Davidic monarchy again. Mm -hmm. And then that was amplified, I think, when the Romans took over, because then you have a foreign, you know, they had lived under Greeks and Persians and lived fairly peacefully under them, but they did not live peacefully under the Romans. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Roman hand was too heavy, or so it would seem. And so I think then, uh, again, it doesn't mean that everybody was sitting around waiting for a Messiah, but that every now and then somebody <clears throat> would come along and would excite a group of foreigners. Mm. Now, we hear of a couple of people, maybe a little bit before Jesus, uh, there was this, a man named Simon and another man named Athronges. These are only mentioned briefly in the historian Josephus, yeah. but the, they got a following. And evidently, some people got excited about Jesus also. And mm -hmm. we'll talk more, I guess, about that as to, to why they got excited about him. And But I, I take seriously the story of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, mm -hmm. you know, riding on a donkey, which was fulfilling a prophecy from Zechariah chapter 9, and with people shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Mm -hmm. But Jesus thought of that, who knows? Mm -hmm. But at least a number of his followers thought that this was it. And what the Romans did in a case like that is crucify first, and have your inquiry later. <laughs> yes. That was settled that. And yep. now, where then do you get the idea of a heavenly Messiah? Mm. Well, what you get, first of all, in the book of Daniel is the idea of a heavenly patron. Mm. The archangel Michael, quite explicitly in the later part of the book. And I think that he is the figure who is described as one like a son of man coming on the clouds of heaven. Oh, right. Right. Uh, in the later chapters of the book, they're fairly clear that there is a battle in heaven mm. between the angel Gabriel and Michael on the one hand and the princes of Persia, Greece on the other. Mm. And so then Michael is the one who is to win the battle. And you get that also in the Dead Sea Scrolls and the War Scroll, mm. that God will raise up the leadership of Michael among the gods and the dominion of Israel among all flesh. So that now these figures were necessarily called messiahs. Mm. The first text that does call, you know, refer to Daniel seven and that son of man, and also call him a messiah, is is the similitudes of Enoch, right. and you also get it in an apocalypse called Fourth Ezra, at mm. the end of the first century. Yeah. But now I think one of your questions here was. Uh, you know, was um, Son of Man uh, a standard expectation? Yeah. But yeah, and, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but was it, was it, the, the question was, is there any evidence in any pre Christian text? Uh, we were mentioning Daniel, of course, regarding a future, the Son of Man as a title. Did the Son of Man act as a title for a particular future figure in pre Christian Judaism? In other words, in Judaism before Christianity? And no, it wasn't a title. Right. But you could have, you know, the text of Daniel was known and people could refer to it. Mm -hmm. And so in the similitudes of Enoch, what you get is that son of man. Right. Now, you know, that's not quite the same thing as the son of man. It's mm -hmm. that son of man. The son yeah. of man just means human being. You're right. Uh, or somebody who looks like a human being in visionary literature. Yeah. Uh, in 4th Ezra, they don't actually use that terminology. They talk about a man riding on a cloud coming up from the sea. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you know the book of Daniel, you know who they're talking about. Mm. That, that this is presumably the figure foretold by Daniel. But it was really the early Christians, I think, who made a title out of it. 
Right, right. So I think Larry Hurt Haddle was right on that point. <laughs> yes, yes. I was. I asked him the question um, that, uh, according to the late Larry Hurt who who um, uh, was American, but I think he, he was in Scotland for some considerable That's time. Right. Um, yeah. uh, he said there was no evidence of Son of Man, in inverted commas, acting as a definitive title for a particular figure, eschatological figure. And I asked if you agree with that assessment, and you, obviously you do, um, and this is very, yeah. very interesting. Uh, but the, the question is about the historical Jesus, then, um, if one yeah. can speak of this. Uh, is he best viewed as a claimant to be a prophetic messiah or a divine messiah? Because in later Christianity, he certainly was seen as a divine figure. Well, to back up one step there, hmm. was there such a thing as a prophetic messiah? Well, there are a couple of cases in the Hebrew Bible where prophets are said to be anointed. Um, you know, I think uh, Elisha is supposed to be anointed oh. at one point. In Isaiah 61, a prophet says, therefore God has anointed me. And, you know, it basically means appointed me, yeah. but the, the word is used. Mm. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they sometimes refer to the prophets as the anointed ones, mm. Mm. which is interesting enough. Mm. And then there is a very interesting and controversial text in the Dead Sea Scrolls, sometimes referred to as the Messiah of heaven and earth, because it starts out, heaven and earth will obey his Messiah. And it goes on then to talk about uh, Pre he raising the dead, healing the sick, and preaching good news to the poor. And even though it's God who does it, you figure God doesn't do his own preaching. You know, that's the job of a herald. Mm -hmm. And if you look for a Messiah whom heaven and earth obey, the figures who come to mind are Elijah and Elisha, actually, especially Elijah. Mm. And so I think, you know, in, also in the, the community rule from Qumran, they talk about this will last until the coming of a prophet and the Messiahs of Aaron and Israel. So they were expecting an eschatological prophet, uh, meaning a prophet who would uh, kind of ring in the change of the, the world, mm. um, who might or might not be called a Messiah. Mm -hmm. So, now, when you look then at the Synoptic Gospels, and I think uh, that's, that's the evidence we have, problematic as it may be, for the historical Jesus. The Gospel of John is, uh, doesn't sound the same, let's say. No. You know, it doesn't seem like the same idiom that Jesus is speaking. Mm -hmm. But in the Synoptics, Jesus is described as going around working miracles, raising the dead, healing the sick, preaching good news to the poor. Mm. And in fact, in the Gospel of Luke, he reads that passage from Isaiah 61 as mm. kind of the, the program yeah. for, for what he's doing. Yeah. And in fact, at one point in the Gospel of Mark, uh, he says to his followers, who do people say that I am? And one of the answers is Elijah or one of the prophets. Yes, yes, very interesting. Now, why then does the, the, the tag of Messiah get stuck on him? Well, I think it's largely because he was going around saying, the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, we could sit here for a month discussing what the kingdom of God might mean. Okay. But it, it evidently meant something for, for Jesus uh, well, and I think it surely meant something different from the world as it now is. Mm. You know, it's, it's uh, the world transformed. But it's still this world, though, isn't it, John? It, we're not it, talking but, about a supernatural heavenly realm. That's, we're talking about... That's right. Right. That's right. Yes. It's talking about the transformation of this world. Mm. Mm. And now people might hear that in different ways. Mm. And I think... Many people would probably have figured if you get the kingdom of God, that means you get a Davidic Messiah coming back. Mm. You know, that a kingdom of God means a kingdom of Judah or entails a kingdom of Judah. 
Mm-hmm. And I think uh, that for the, the people who heard Jesus say this, they came to believe that, well, he must be the one who is going to bring it. And Jesus himself seems to have been very evasive mm. on it. Uh, you know, people, scholars talk about the messianic secret. Mm-hmm. Because you have just a couple of cases in the gospel where he breaks down and tells people, uh, you know, with with Peter, when um, uh, supposedly he, he prophesies how he is going to, referring to himself as the son of man, and how he has to go up to Jerusalem and suffer and die. And then uh, uh, Peter says no, and he says, get behind me, Satan. But I think it's pretty clear from the Gospels that he did not go around saying publicly, I am the Messiah. I am the one you're waiting for. And so I think this is something, I think maybe his followers already believed that he was, But I think what they expected of him when he went up to Jerusalem was totally different from what happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it must have been a huge shock. You know, if you go into Jerusalem saying, Hosanna to the son of David, and you think that this man can, you know, perform miracles. And then, no, he's captured and crucified. And he wasn't actually the only person that that happened to. No. We have a series of figures. Uh, Josephus, the yeah. Jewish historian who wrote the story of the Jewish war against Rome, mm. in the warm up, so to speak, to the rebellion, mm. there were several figures who came along. One of them took a crowd of people up on the Mount of Olives and told them that at his word, the walls of Jerusalem would fall down. Mm. Well, they didn't. Or the Romans got there first. Hmm. And somebody else told them that the waters of the Jordan would part before him. I mean, these people, you know, thought they were um, reenacting biblical scenes. And I don't doubt that some of the followers of Jesus expected that he would do something like that too. Hmm. Although I don't see any indication that he himself said so. Hmm. So then what happened was he was arrested, crucified, and normally speaking, you would expect that to be the end of the story. Mm. But then, evidently, a few days later, people started saying that they had seen him alive. And the evidence really was visions. Visions, right. You know, an empty tomb doesn't prove anything. Mm -hmm. Charlie Chaplin's tomb was found empty at one point. Nobody figured he had risen. (laughs) Uh, You know, and and the counter story then was that somebody stole the body. Yeah. Which is, you know, what you would normally think if a tomb were found empty. But enough people claim to have seen him, experienced him. And now it's very hard, you know, to pronounce on the reality of something like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, I remember in my early years teaching, a couple came along to an evening class. And after class, they came up to me and said that their son had been killed in an accident. And they were really upset about this. And then one evening when they were in bed, he came in and stood at the foot of the bed and said, it's all right. Now, what do you say if somebody tells you a story like that? I think think your point that this is actually uh, in the literature is actually a surprisingly common almost experience. Um, It's not unique um, at all. Uh, I remember a story I read years ago, the famous English translator of the New Testament, J.B. Phillips, which is a very readable kind of colloquial translation. It wasn't very literal at all. Anyway, um, he, he, um, he knew C.S. Lewis, the great Christian apologist, yes. author of the, you know, the Lion, the Witch in the Wardrobe and all that. Um, he knew him in Oxford or Cambridge, I forget which. Anyway, C.S. Lewis died. J.B. Phillips didn't know. J.B. Phillips was sitting there in his study at Oxford, I think it was. 
And C.S. Lewis just sat, uh, actually appeared, apparently, in a chair opposite J.B. Phillips. Bright as day, 3D, there was C.S. Lewis, had a conversation with him. Now, C.S. Lewis had died. <laughs> I mean, he was dead. Yeah. And um, now, J.B. Phillips is an otherwise, was an otherwise sane person. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> passing judgment on this experience. I really yeah. am not. And that's yeah. not my point. My point is that it happens that th these kind of things happen to grieving parents. Terrible story you, you've mentioned there. Plus to slightly more, um, you know, everyday things where a colleague has passed away. It happens. So when you have people saying, well, this this person, Jesus of Nazareth, he has such a huge impact on our lives. And, you know, we, we, he perhaps passed away and his tomb is empty. Did he go to the did we go to the right tomb, by the way? Anyway, and he appears to us. Yeah, I can believe that because it kind of happens. It happens to people yeah. at Oxford. It happens to people that you you met. It happens to grieving parents. It happens. Um, I don't know why it happens. I don't know if it's objectively yeah. real. It could be. It might not be. I don't know. It's above my pay grade, but it happens for sure. Yeah, I mean there there is some real experience underlying mm. it. Mm. No. At the same time, you know, it's not the same kind of reality that we have most of the time. Mm. You know, you can't necessarily call the person back, get the person to appear on demand, mm. uh, or know what becomes of them otherwise. Yes. But I think from the viewpoint of the people having the experience, it is very real and deserves respect. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, okay. Um, I just want to, uh, in your uh, marvelous book, um, King and Messiah's Son of God, I, I read a, a fascinating comment on um, the Apostle Thomas's acclamation uh, in the Gospel of John, John 20, 28, where Thomas says to Jesus, my Lord and my God. And um, in chapter eight, there's a little, tiny little footnote here, which I thought was really, really interesting. Um, you uh, you are citing a, another scholar um, who I won't mention his name, but it, who said that this verse where Thomas says to Jesus, my Lord, my God, John 20, 28, is the one verse in the New Testament which does unquestionably describe Christ as God. OK, now you're quite critical of that because you go on to say this view fails to recognize, however, that the phrase Dominus et Deus and presumably its Greek equivalent in the Gospel of John, is an honorific acclamation used, for example, by those who wish to flatter Domitian. Domitian, of course, was the Roman emperor towards the end of the first century when yeah. the Gospel of John presumably was written. Um, now, could you elaborate on that? Because surely people will say G Thomas is just calling Jesus God. I mean, God is a very equivocal term in that period. Now, uh, it, uh, in the Hebrew Bible, there really isn't monotheism. If by that you mean the idea that only one God exists. You know, what has happened in Christianity, certainly, and probably in Judaism and Islam too, is that the, the beings uh, that used to be called gods got to be downgraded. And so people call them angels or demons or whatever. But in the first century, many people would still refer to them as gods. So, so a god is not human, although you get some humans who are also gods, mm. <laughs> including, I might add, the king in ancient Israel. Yeah. I mean, is it, is it Psalm 45? The Psalm 45, yeah. the king is actually called God. Directly, yes. in an extraordinary passage. In Isaiah 9, you get uh, another human figure called God, and Jesus quotes Psalm yes. 82, doesn't he? In John's Gospel, you shall be as gods, referring to mm -hmm. judges of Israel. So this language is used yeah. very elastically uh, uh, around the place. So I think, you know, to say my Lord and my God is like saying my master, oh. your majesty. Right. It's something like that. Although I do think that that chapter was written by Adela rather than by me. 
the New Testament chapters of that book, but but no, uh, no, sorry, we yeah, agree on. Right. Apologies, no, you co you co wrote right. this indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, so you're saying that this is not to be pressed in a literal sense in, in in accordance with the beliefs of later times when strict monotheism was the kind of norm everywhere. That's right. Yeah, but there is monotheism in Jewish scriptures. I mean, Isaiah famously in Isaiah forty onwards, you get these great monotheistic uh, even, statements. Even, you know, I am the Lord there, your God. Even there, I would say not. Really, I think you know he will still talk about Baal and Nebo being bowed down. So I think you know the point at issue there is who's the boss, mm. who's the real God. But it's not questioning that there are. Uh, you know, that the gods of the other nations do exist. They're just not any good. Mm. They don't have any real power. Mm. So I think actually the idea of monotheism really only comes in with Greek philosophy, right. where you begin to get the idea of the exclusion of opposites. Right. No, because, you know, in mythological thinking, you can maintain contradictory things mm. Mm. Right. cheerfully. Okay. So, but even in the the uh, Hellenistic Jewish literature written in Greek, mm -hmm. a text that comes to mind is one called Pseudo Phocylides. It's like a wisdom text composed in the name of the Greek poet Phocylides, uh, but you know, fairly transparently Jewish for all of that. Mm -hmm. And one of the things it says that is that when good people die, they become gods. Theoi. In Greek. Right. Now, you know, that I think all he meant by that is what we would say they go to heaven. But, yeah. you know, that's passed over to a different mode of existence from the normal human one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but just a final question, if I may, is a complete change of subject and coming back to your um, specialism as a, an, an Old Testament scholar, and is it is an academic question? So, apologies to viewers who uh, this, this may not be terribly of ter terrible relevance, but um, it's about the uh, the documentary hypothesis. Uh, this is obviously the the authorship of the Pentateuch, um, mm -hmm. Torah. Um, now, the question is, what is the current scholarly consensus concerning the documentary hypothesis? Would it be fair to say that modern scholars tend to agree that while the Pentateuch is the first five books of Moses, so-called, probably consists of earlier multiple independent sources, which were combined to give us the Pentateuch, mm -hmm. we, we cannot confidently identify these once independent sources in a scientific manner. Are modern scholars less confident these days in their ability to identify possible sources and interpolations in the Pentateuch? What is the status of the documentary hypothesis then in modern biblical scholarship? Like all great academic issues, mm. opinion is divided into at least two camps. Right. Yeah. Now, if you go to Germany and ask that question, I think almost everyone would agree that no, you can't identify. You can. Everyone would probably grant that there is a priestly source, right? And a Deuter that Deuteronomy mm. is different, although they may disagree as to whether uh, you have bits of Deuteronomy in the other books. But the old hypothesis was four sources: mm. Yahwist, Elohist. Deuteronomist and priestly writer. Mm. And the Europeans, by and large, have now opted for what, what they call in German Fortschreibung. And that is to say, a kind of rolling corpus whereby scribes modify verses here and there. And, but it's very hard to pin down stages. Against that, my colleague here at Yale, Joel Baden, is a staunch defender of the four, uh, four documentary hypothesis. Mm. He learned that from a man named Baruch Schwartz, a Jewish scholar uh, at Hebrew University. Uh, Jeffrey Stackert in Chicago is another member of the neo-documentarian school. 
And I think they make a very good case. Right. I think, you know, and you won't probably get any two scholars who will agree exactly mm. on every verse. Mm. But I think most people have a pretty good idea of what we call the Yahwist, what we call the Elohist. And, um, you know, I think uh, some of the... Um, some, some of the German scholarship is a little bit overdone. That, that, that it's, uh, it's making too many fine distinctions. Yes, yes, yes. I know what you mean. So, uh, you know, I have an introductory textbook to the Hebrew Bible, and I opt for the documentary hypothesis. Now, my reason for doing that in large part is that I think it gives you a readable text. Yeah. And if you're trying to explain the text to students, you, you've got to be able to show some coherence in it. And the German approach tends to undermine the coherence. Mm. Okay. And people spend an awful lot of time saying this verse reflects that verse. Yeah. It really doesn't matter to anybody. Yeah, it's very speculative. Anyway, that strikes me yeah. as quite speculative sometimes. Yeah. Um, so that's the state, you know, the, the, mm. uh, I think in North America, and Israel, mm. the, all, the documentary hypothesis is alive and well. Right. And in Europe, it's on its deathbed, but it hasn't <laughs> already expired. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that's fascinating. So, yeah, yeah there's, there's clearly two, two, two views here um, uh, simultaneously held globally. And I think in Britain, uh, they might be a little more inclined to go with the American approach. Mm. Mm. You'll find exceptions to everything, of course. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, that's fascinating. Thank you for that um, uh, very interesting uh, summary. And uh, well, just in conclusion, well, I, I, you say you're just retiring. Well, I do wish you well in your in your well deserved retirement. Uh, well, you Thank said you. before. We said before we went uh, live, so to speak, that uh, I was just remarking that you, you're an Irishman uh, originally, yes. and you've kept your. Irish accent, pretty much. And, but you said you've been in the States, what, 50 years? Was that what you said to me? Yes, probably a little more now. I first came to the wow. States in the fall of 1969. Gosh. And I taught for one year in Dublin in 72 to 73. Mm -hmm. Then I came back to the States and I've been here since. <laughs> so that would be out of the last, what, 53 years. I've spent 52 of them. Here, I think. Amazing. Gosh, well, that's an extraordinary uh, career. Um, as a problem, one of the problems, the challenge I had in introducing you, I look at your, uh, your CV, your bibliography, and so on. It's so vast. And I can see why you've been at it for over half a century, yeah. so to speak. Uh, and, um, but anyway, there's a whole Wikipedia page, folks, if you want to see uh, more of, of your incredible. I never look at that stuff. No. <laughs> so there's nothing I look, up, I look up other people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I figure it's just as well not to know, you know, I don't want to know who did not say that I am. <laughs> no, no, no. It, it's all like perfectly that. about the board and everything. No, it's very nice stuff. There's nothing horrible about you. Why would there be? Oh, so, so, I mean, do, do you have any, in your in your retirement, in terms of academic work, are you thinking of producing any further work or, you, or is that it for, for the future? Well, you know, I have a couple of unfinished projects. Right. Uh, one of which is a commentary on the community rule from Qumran. Wow. And uh, that, a lot of that is done, but I have a collaborator on it, a man who is my student, and um, he's a little bit behind. He has a young child and he has a more complicated wow. life at this stage. And then uh, we're doing a new edition of uh, apocalyptic texts ah, in yeah. English. Absolutely. Good. And most of those will be due to come in this coming summer. Right. And right now, I had contributed to the old one, uh, the the treatment of the Sibylline Oracles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm revising that right now. That's what's open on my desk here. Wonderful. And then I just might. I did the, the last authored book that I had was mm. called What Are Biblical Values? It's a very different kind of book. Yeah. And what I might yet do is something on the Bible and human rights. Oh, right. Yes, indeed. I have a lecture on that that I gave last fall and will give again now at a conference in a month or so. Mm. And um, 
I have been encouraged by a publisher to follow up on it, but I, I need to get the other things put to bed first. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased you're, you're continuing a very active life as a retired. I use the word retired in inverted commas. Because <laughs> you're not retired. Uh, but no, you, you've left. You've retired from your teaching duties at yeah. uh, Yale, of course, perhaps. Um, that's how it goes. That's how it goes. Well, I do wish yeah. you all the very best with that. And, uh, and thank you uh, very much indeed, Professor John J. Collins. Uh, it's been absolutely fascinating um, uh, hearing you speak about all these various issues. And, uh, and thank you very much indeed for your time. And thank you. It's been a pleasure.